The top three stories of the week. Welcome back to All That Jam, where music has new limits. I'm Kevin. I'm joined by Amanda, as always. And we're here to talk the top three stories of the week. Probably, uh, I guess the first thing I want to throw out at you before we do the top three stories of the week is Fish is going to have a media blitz this week. They recorded a tiny desk today. They're doing Fallon on Thursday. The new album's coming out, I guess, Friday, maybe next Tuesday, however they're working it. Then tour starts. So I guess my question to you to start off is, should we be worried that a song like mm -hmm. Oval may become a summertime radio hit? You know what, Kevin? <laughs> I was thinking something kind of similar to that. And my thought was more of, is it possible that fish could ever jump the shark with anything? Because they've managed to not do that in all of these years. And I guess maybe that phrase, I don't know if that's a commonly used phrase anymore, but kind of become a caricature of yourself. Yeah. To the point where Even people meat stick they didn't. Something like meat stick. Oh, they no. didn't. <laughs> but you know, it's that tongue in cheekiness thing that they do that makes it really hard to jump the shark because they're also laughing with us right at the same time. What you're talking about, I think, is a little bit different because it seems a little more earnest promotional stuff that we don't see all the time, of course, and we often don't see it in multiples either. So I think it's a very valid question, and I guess we won't know until we know. But I mean, my thinking is probably not. But you know what? I guess it's what? always a possibility plus I don't know why my mind immediately goes back to big farmhouse, you know, on TV, the late show, or like, you know, when that happened, I guess it was Letterman, right? At that point. Um, mm -hmm. And people were, not that people were worried about it then, but that was so mainstream and it was weird. I remember watching. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, there is that feeling of, well, do we really want this? You know? <laughs> but part of my thing is they believe evolved. Like, they're like, this is a great song, and it is. It's a well-written song. It's got a catchy chorus. It's got an interesting lyric on the surface. But I guess that's my issue. They're no longer being tongue-in-cheek. They believe this. They're like, evolve is who we are. And, and it shows in so many ways. I guess then maybe I need to redefine what my expectations would be for a situation like this, because this is new and different for those factors that we were just talking about. And, and it would make it more likely that something could shoot out there in a more public a way that gets embraced, maybe in a, in a different fashion. But, but on the other side, as opposed to, let's say, Touch of Grey, because that's going to be everybody's, you know, mm -hmm. North Star when it comes to the touch heads and all that. Um, you have evolved. The rest of Touch of Grey are in the dark. The rest of that album were all rock songs, normal mm -hmm. songs. Last night they released Life Saving Gun at midnight. <laughs> yeah. Which is a weird ass little jam that's one of my favorite Fish Studio things I've heard in years in the mm -hmm. middle of. It. So maybe they're like, all right, we really do believe this song. Kind of like, remember Bouncing when it was... Uh, you know, Bounce it could have been their hit. It should have been the hit song, but it was on Lawn Boy, which was a self for you know, the album they put out themselves or not a huge label. It was before Electra, so I don't know. Maybe they'll get their hit. Do you want a hit? I mean, what did Ryan say from Humphreys? I want a hit. Yeah. Joel's I mean, a hit. A small hit. <laughs> right? And so, you know, I, I guess, too, and I've had this conversation with – um a number of people who are just as much, you know, fish fans as anyone else and really care deeply and said, you know, part of the challenge for a lot of us is the joyous acceptance of where fish is today. And that this, like you said, this is who they are. And so if this is who they are, then have at it, right? Like, go for it. Um, I just think that it's it's something that feels very different and it's cool and all to see see them doing these things. I guess mm -hmm. I don't really stop to think about what that could mean in a broader sense mm -hmm. to other people 
who maybe have just heard of fish or haven't seen them and they say, wow, this is super accessible mm -hmm. for me. I, you know, I can, I can sing along to this or something. So yep. we'll know, we'll know soon. <laughs> right. So we're, we're past kind of like the first hurdle of the summer concert season with the 4th of July there. I just saw something really interesting at the Denver airport in between two of the terminals. Apparently they have bands play for free on Sunday, right? On Sundays on mm -hmm. August 11th, the motet will be playing there for free at the airport. Yes. And anyone can go. <laughs> I, love it. I love it. That is so cool. Denver's like, not only were we the coolest city before, we're even cooler now. Yes, and I love that they're doing that. The The musical thing um, is a nice use of that space. And for anyone that's maybe in the area or curious, there's a lot of room there. That area that you're talking about, they do ice skating in the winter. There's a bar, restaurant. It's a great spot if you're kind of waiting to pick someone up and you have time, something's delayed and you don't want to just, you know, rot in a cell phone. Brilliant idea. Brilliant idea. Yeah. So, um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited for that. <laughs> you know, I here in Baltimore has the car lot where mm -hmm. you go and sit and wait for the phone call in a lot with all these other people. And it's like so sketch. Well, yeah, because these airports, I mean, they never were designed for something like this, you know, so they just don't know what to do. I mean, granted, mm -hmm. you'd have to pay for parking at DIA if you wanted to enjoy um, that or have someone drop you off, I guess. But worth it to go see the motet at an airport. Yeah, right, a car full of people. It's ten bucks each, or whatever it is. Oh, right? yeah. be great. Go get a snack, hang out, <laughs> watch some airplanes land. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. It is. It's hot, and I guess we're getting into the dog days of summer. Can we call the dog days of summer the middle of July? I think these days anything goes. <laughs> With the way the world's heating up there, I just I don't know what to do, but. We have some really interesting stories there. So why don't we uh, jump in, dealer's choice there, what you got to start us off. All right, Kevin, I wanna start with uh, with the story that I told you was just somehow getting stuck in my brain as I was trying to think through it. So let's start with a story that you had shared with me that I am fascinated with. So- Scalpers versus Ticketmaster, part three. Scalpers, <laughs> ha part 3000, I feel like. Right. <laughs> Scalper, yeah, tune in for more. So, okay, so let, let me try to break this down. And as I said before we started recording, tell me if I'm like just totally off base here. So very recently, there was a lawsuit filed in California. All good stories seem to start that way these days. <laughs> I don't know why. It's a lawsuit filed. Um, okay, so Axis um, has kind of opened up the door a little bit to reveal some, how do I put this? Some undercurrent of, of kind of um, technology that's being used by ticket scalpers um, and Let's call it fuckery. Yeah, against Ticketmaster and Axis. So this is not a play to victimize Ticketmaster and Axis. I find this actually oh. very interesting and almost ironic in a sense. Um, so scalpers have now figured out how to um, take tickets that are called untransferable. And we all know, you know, what that is. We all have that happen to us sometimes. So tickets that can't be transferred, Kevin, the first thing that came to my mind were like fish dicks, four night run tickets. Right. You know, you I think they are. They are summer. Yeah. Um, so how to extract those from an account by getting a, a barcode on kind of another platform that's kind of running in the same way that the scalpers are controlling, all so that those untransferable tickets can be transferred and sold. That's where my disconnect too is. What is this other platform that they keep referring to? It's like, they don't want to tell you too much about it. Well, yeah, that's right. Because then people are like, oh, that's how it works. Interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so I guess they've created um, kind of a, a mirror platform that in some ways can just act as the intermediary. It creates a Ticketmaster barcode that has the one little block missing that says you can't transfer. Right, and the, and the article, which was on 404media.co, said that in most cases, that barcode is, is gonna scan as a genuine barcode and that Axis doesn't 
really know that this is happening. Oh. Yeah, so access, because these services, again, another vague word, um, are hacking, access doesn't know that they're doing that. And the tickets are real tickets, which I think is like- So I'm fine. I, I could care less because I bought the ticket. I was willing to pay $400 to see Taylor Swift and I got in to see my show. Yeah, right, exactly. So I think um, in this case, it's a little bit of a Robin Hood kind of situation, maybe, where now Axis, I'm sure we'll start to see as this lawsuit goes forward, how much um, revenue Axis feels that they're losing in the sense that if those tickets were transferable, there might, there'd be fees associated or who knows what could possibly. Or, or, they, or they do the thing where Ticketmaster forces you to resell it on their platform. You can yeah. resell the ticket, but you're going to have to resell on our platform, pay us a fee, and the person who buys it's going to have to pay us a fee too. Yeah, the first one isn't even free. Like, what kind of deal is that? <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's not how you hook people. No, no, which they know they don't have to. Um, right. Yeah, I, I tell you, the last couple of times I was trying to get a verified reseller ticket on Ticketmaster, I get all the way through the process, and, and then. Yeah, it's not available. Something can't do that. Oops. Right. Got to buy the the regular one, you know. Right. I got an email from Ticketmaster the other day saying it's not really our fault that all the everybody's data got hacked and hey, have a free year TransUnion credit monitoring. What? I went to the, the the next ad that popped up on Facebook when I opened it up was file now for Ticketmaster lawsuit. <laughs> I was like, click. Wow. Not. That's well, not. Like, you get a check for like twenty-seven dollars or something. Yeah. Wow. I'll take uh, my twenty-seven. Screw you, chicken master. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all kind of feel that way. So you know, to me, what's most fascinating about this is the technology angle of this. Um, that these scalpers, you know, we're so advanced now, and, and it may be a simple thing. Like I have no idea, right? But we're at the point now where something like that could happen which tells me that the next step in all of this, if it's not happening already would be, okay, so we they can take care of those untransferable tickets. What's to stop them from removing any ticket from right. anyone's account and giving that barcode to someone else where now maybe the original is no longer valid or you have two people now right. trying to use the same ticket because it's been mirrored. It, it, it's technology, once it alters the original, you can't use the original. So I'm wondering if that would be a potential. I mean, it seems like they, they, aren't, they aren't doing it for that nefarious reason. They're just doing it in order to continue their business. So they're trying to screw anybody over. It's just a function of all of a sudden I can't transfer all these tickets I bought. I don't know. I'm jaded. I feel like that would be a next step. Like, why not try to make even more by taking somebody's. Oh, right, right. The evil little brothers lurking in the wings. Definitely. Somebody's thinking about it. But since I don't know how to do it. I am completely innocent and you know, you can't, you can't hold me to any of that. I know nothing. I know literally nothing. So the saga continues, um, you know, if people just use their smarts for, for good things, imagine all the stuff we would have in this world. Right. It'd be amazing, but I'm not going to go down that road today. Next week. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll get even more meta on it. Um, okay. This next story I think was just fun. You know, it, it crossed, um, Kind of my news feed and i took a deeper look at it so of course we talk about jam bands a lot and we're going to end our top three this week with a a really wonderful um story you know that kind of sits squarely in the jam band scene but there's also really cool stuff that happens outside of that so i read an article recently about uh glastonbury you know the really mm -hmm. um i think in this case one of the more legendary you know well-known and accepted festivals that happens outside of the U.S. Um, and here we have this um, this woman who has a background in radio, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, she Her name's Georgia Mann, and she works at BBC Broadcasting House. Um, she presents something called Radio 3's Essential Classics. So she's very well-versed in classical music she was able to play a DJ set at Glastonbury 
um, just recently and wrote an article about it um, because she wanted to see if um, she could, as she says, cross the musical Rubicon. And so mm -hmm. she was the first act um, at uh, you know 11 a.m. on a Friday morning of the festival. And her big question is, could she get this crowd who's all ready for the Black Pumas, Coldplay, to get super stoked for Bach and other classical music. I mean, I there's something about this that just absolutely made me smile. So she had an hour um, and she, she said her set list spanned 500 years worth of music. Um, she didn't wanna to think too much about it, um, but she wanted to create an upbeat mood for what was going to happen, you know, later on in that day, the next couple of days. So she didn't want to go with um, relaxing classics, as she said, um, but she wanted to show that classical music can excite people. You know, it can have more of an effect on someone's mood or mindset than just relaxing or maybe something in the background. And so um, I think what we probably would want to do, and I can share the um, Spotify playlist that she put together um, for this. I could not believe when I listened to this, how she was able to pick certain artists and certain music. Um, I mean, you really have to know what you're talking about with classical music, I think, to be able to do this, you know? Um, but I love it because she said, you know, I knew I needed a killer opener. <laughs> so Max Richter, um, who wrote the theme for The Leftovers, he's incredibly, um, I think, I, one of those um, classical composers that is relatable in modern mm -hmm. times. So he did a take on The Four Seasons by Vivaldi. Long story short, she felt really good about this set and said that the biggest reaction came when she played something called Hannah Peel's Sunrise Through the Dusty Nebula. It's this otherworldly um, masterpiece, as she calls it. She had a 29-piece band to play. And it almost did remind me of something that you could sample in like an EDM set or something like that. So we'll share the article. I just thought it was really fun. And I love anything that brings together what seems like totally disparate genres too. And, and she even brought in the secular, quote unquote, with the Bob Marley tune. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was very thought out, I think. Um, it did remind me a couple times as we've talked with um, different artists on this show, I've brought up a blog that I love. It's a music blog that referenced um, Stravinsky and the Rites of Spring as pretty revolutionary and weird um, mm -hmm. for lack of, for lack of more <laughs> better vocabulary for that one. But I think all these things point to, you know, like anything else, you don't want to make too many assumptions about any musical genre and what it can do or not. So this was just really fun. Um, and, you know, it sounds like she crushed it. Yep. <laughs> so we'll, um, we'll get some information out there if anyone's curious what that means. You know, how do you play classical music at Glastonbury? Um, but Kevin, let's go to the last story for this week, which there's a story here, but I think also, as I mentioned to you, this just made me so happy. We know how much Mark Brownstein, Brownie, you know, puts into the work that he does, how much he absolutely loves and is grateful for his career. We've talked to him um, over the last week or so. Um, Mark, as well as members of Eggy, um, did a, a smallish run called the Brownstein Family Band. And I've been following this. Kevin, have you been able to kind of read a little bit of either Mark's post or some of the other information about um, this recent run? I have. Now, they did a couple shows, I guess, back February, January or something. They did two shows, I think. So this is the, you know, they decided, hey, we're going to, uh, you know, take it, mm -hmm. try to expand on it a little bit, expand what the thing is. Mark was asking suggestions for songs on Twitter. And um, he uh, he also I um, we I was talking to him and uh, we were talking about tomorrow never news on Twitter that I thought that they had really locked in on that the third night I guess of the four nights and I feel like there's a lot lot of room to go with this I really think that I think he loves playing with his kid 
I mean, that's got to be the greatest thing ever oh. to look over and see your son back there ripping it. I know. And, and I mean, and the music's been great. You're right. So they did a debut show at Nectar's uh, in, in Burlington in January, which I think is where Zach goes to school. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there was kind of a natural connection, if I remember correctly. Um, so this was their first um, multi-show run for this group, which I think is just incredible. So yeah, so Sun Zach and then Eggy bandmates, uh, Jake Brownstein and Danny um, all came no together. Relation. And the posts that Mark was putting out, no relation, thank you, yes, um, were I think just so heartfelt that it made me stop. And I always love Mark's posts. I think he's very prolific on social media and very authentic in a way that comes across just naturally because of who he is. But, um, you know, the the way that I think they approached these shows and the song selection and everything um, just, yeah, shows where he's at in his life and his career. And I think wanting to make the most of, of every single moment. Um, so I will say that um, for this run, they added about 10 new songs. A handful of those were Biscuit songs and then some were Eggy as well with um, a whole bunch of originals. And as Mark said, you know, playing these with um, Zach is one of the coolest things he's ever gotten to do. And he was so proud about how professional Zach is. I mean, just amazing. Right. And some Dead and Jerry thrown in there. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, as well as playing, um, which was it? Was it Jamila? I think they haven't played in almost 10 years, Biscuits. What's that? <laughs> I wonder if that showed up at Biscuit Land over the past few weekends, over the past weekend, because it, now it's fresh in his head that he did it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the cool part about that, too, in addition to bringing something back that really hadn't been played in a long time, was uh, updating some lyrics. And this was a post that I really got into. Um, so they updated singing, I want to feel you up, but only with your consent. And Mark specifically called out Ashley and GrooveSafe. They've always been um, big supporters of GrooveSafe from way back when. Um, and so it was a nice moment to also kind of bring in that aspect of of our culture too and a happy birthday to ashley i believe her birthday was yesterday it was it was yep a long-ranging tour that just ended and always busy um so i would say you know if you're curious about these family band shows i think most of them are up on nugs uh if i'm thinking correctly and um Live for Live Music has all the set lists, but um, I think when I, and I've heard some of this, I've heard some of the recordings, honestly, it's just super energetic um, and you can tell they're just having such a good time with it. Yes, I wanna see where it goes. Maybe we can get a little mini tour if everybody's schedules can sync up. I mean, the way Disco Biscuits and Eggy hit it with their bands is just, did you see Disco Biscuits are going to Alaska? Yeah. I don't remember when, though. I don't remember when that's happening. Um, I don't know. It's like a year out. Oh. But you got to sell. That's okay. a big price. Yeah, you got to plan you know? this thing. Yeah, for sure. Well, we appreciate everything that they bring and, and trying new things. That's what it's all about. That is what it's all about. All right. Anything else you want to throw out before we wrap up? You know what? I think I'm going to leave it there. Super excited for uh, for the next month or so. We've got Mondegreen coming up before we know it. Can't wait for that. Uh, and a bunch of fun stuff in between. Yep. Make sure you check out our interview from yesterday with Jason Samuel. And Yam Yam is coming up quick. We're going to have Jim Lauderdale next week. Maybe something special with Kendall Street Company that we're nailing down. And remember, stay beautiful. But don't stay underground too long. We'll see you soon. All right, Kevin. Thanks. <laughs>